obviously we know that dams are very sensitive issues, but we need to look at this in the context of the, the broader con continuum of storage options. I mean, dams are one option, and in some places they may be the most appropriate option. But if you look at the, the other uh, aspects of storage, you've got everything from small-scale uh, ponds, you've got underground storage in, in, in groundwater, you've got rainwater harvesting and these sorts of things. So it's very, very context-specific, and it's not black or white. I think uh, the, the issues have to be looked at on, a, on an individual basis. And if we look at other energy technologies, for example, if you look at sort of biomass, for example, there are pros and cons to that in terms of the amount of land it takes up, the amount of water it takes up and may take away from food production. If you look at shale gas fracking, you have a similar issue there in terms of the, the use of water and the potential environmental issues. For thermal generation, issues around coal or other fossil fuels, you've got uh, water for cooling and you've also got contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions. So I think you know, we have to look at these things in a more integrated and holistic way. For hydropower, I think we've learned probably quite a lot in the last few years in terms of how to, to mitigate some of these issues and, and provide more of a balance you know, between the environmental issues and the economic issues around energy generation. Now, Amy's done a lot of work uh, in, in several river basins ar around these, these nexus issues. Mekong's are a very good example. What kind of work have we been doing there? I think the Mekong is one area where this nexus really comes together, this sort of interface between food, energy, water, and the environment. Uh, so if you look, for example, in the Delta area, there's been issues about competing uses for uh, shrimp and rice uh, irrigation and how to balance that. If you look at you know, the hydropower issues further up in the basin, you have issues about, well, what is the wider environmental footprint of hydropower and how can that be, the, the, the impacts be modified by looking at the environmental flow characteristics or maybe constructing artificial wetlands. So there's a, there's a number of areas there, I think, which you know, need to be looked at, and some of the research that's come out of, of IMI is beginning to inform, inform that debate on how to make hydropower more sustainable. And then, as I said before, you have to look at, well, is hydropower the only option? Can you also look at maybe combining hydropower and groundwater storage? So if you change the hydrology and have higher peak flows coming out of hydropower projects, maybe you should store those underground and then use those again later for irrigation with small-scale pumps. So I think it's, a, it's one of those other areas where you do need to bring in the broader perspectives, not just look only at energy, but look at the implications for water, irrigation, food, and the environment. But irrigation in of itself uses energy. Indeed. I mean, there's a lot of, for example, there's a big push now on, on groundwater, particularly for smallholder farmers. But these are relatively small amounts of energy for small pumps. And in fact, the, if you're developing hydropower, then it's probably more efficient to use small pumps for groundwater rather than reducing the amount of economic benefit you can get from hydropower to allow uh, surface water irrigation. So again, these all trade-offs need to be considered on a case-by-case on a -case basis. Now, as you say, th these are immensely complex issues with, with multiple factors affecting the energy side, the natural resource side, particularly in the areas like the Mekong, where you've got enormous population pressure, pressure for economic growth. What can an institution like IMI contribute to this debate? Well, as a research organization focusing on development outcomes, I think probably there are three areas to touch on. And the first is providing the knowledge base, the research, the evidence, you know, what is really happening out there and what are the consequences of different development decisions. And there's a lot of advocacy uh, talk around these different things. You see that in many of the publications around dams. I think IMI can help with other partners to provide that evidence around what are the impacts, the social and the environmental impacts, and, and what have been the positive and negative consequences of different decisions. I think beyond that, obviously, this is all about trade-offs and taking decisions around trade-offs. So what are the tools and products that an organization like IMI and its partners can, can provide to help decision makers in taking those, the right decisions, which, which minimize any negative consequences and increase the benefits for, for all, not just the economic benefits, but also the benefits for, for smallholders, for landless people. For example, in going back to the Mekong, I mean, one of the big challenges there is the balance between hydropower generation and the consequences for capture fisheries. So you know, what is that trade-off? What are the mitigating measures that can be put in place? 
And the third area, I think, is really in terms of working with government agencies, the private sector, and others to pilot test different options, new ideas that are coming up, uh, that are bringing together agencies that haven't naturally worked together in the past.